The progress of human civilization is often marked by the shift from food gathering to food production. Another index is the change in the kind of tools used by human beings. Over time, we have progressed from using stone and bone implements to sophisticated machinery. However, one of the special features of India is the coexistence of various modes of production and the use of different types of tools simultaneously. This stone implement could be more than 200,000 years old. Tools like this mark the beginning of civilization. The difference between human beings and other animals is only that human beings use tools. They use a variety of instruments. The first instruments that they started using were made of stones. They were crude cuttings on stones, which were made in what is known as the old stone age or the Paleolithic period. After that, tools became finer, sharper, more efficient. And with that, human beings progressed from food gathering, hunting, to food growing agriculture and then to industry and to various other types of manufacture. The old stone age represents the beginning, however, of the transition from ape to man. The stone age has been with us in India for several millennia and is still thriving today. And along with stone tools which are in use today, the remnants of tools from long ago keep cropping up as well. A factory for mass producing stone tools existed at this site in Tamil Nadu, now known as Athrimbakkam. The era when tools were made exclusively from stone and bones is divided into several periods. The oldest is the Paleolithic age when crude tools, like this implement, were fashioned from stones and were used for basic tasks like killing and skinning animals. Then came the new stone age tools became sharper and hence more efficient. In the Bronze Age, the smelting of metals began and tools were then made out of copper and its alloys. The evolution to metal tools took several hundred thousand years and much happened during the course of that period. By the time of the new stone age, people in India had made considerable progress in cultural terms, although hunting appears to have been the dominant way of life. In the caves at Bhimbetka, the stone age people have left us a vivid diary in pictures. It is usually thought that the horse was unknown in India until much later. But these prehistoric paintings found in the caves at Bhimbetka suggest otherwise. The grinding stone, still seen in many Indian households, is one of the living links with the past. This stone, in use today in the village of Dholavira, is not very different from one dug up at the Harappan site nearby. 
The grinding stone even tells us about social differences. In an upper caste household, the kern is held from the top, while the lower castes hold it from the sides. Perhaps a carryover from the time when the well-to-do would merely grind condiments with it, while the poor mainly used it for grinding corn. As well as this functional importance, stone acquired a ritual value. This is dramatically evident in what are known as megalithic burial sites, where large stones are used to mark graves. So 2000 years back, it was the custom of our ancestors to bury their dead bodies some four feet below the surface level and used to attract them or decorate them in the form of circles, chiron circles, dolmens, like that. Along with the uh, skeletal remains of the dead, he has used some materials like dagger, pottery, uh, even other things also, isn't it? So they also used to be buried along with the skeletal remains. The bodies and some of their possessions were buried in large pottery urns. This practice was particularly prevalent in South India and finds a mention in Tamil Sangam literature. The simultaneous use of stone and metal tools was already a feature of a much more ancient prehistoric civilization which flourished more than 2,500 years before Christ. This was the famous Harappan culture, somewhat inaccurately known as the Indus Valley Civilization. This culture is known as Chalcolithic, signifying that both copper and stone implements were used simultaneously. The core of the Harappan civilization was the valley of the Indus River and its tributaries, but it spread over half a million square miles. To date, more than 300 sites have been excavated. The best known sites of the Chalcolithic civilization are of course Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. But Kalibanga in Rajasthan is no less impressive. It has all the characteristics of the Indus Valley cities, well-planned streets, nice houses. The site itself is divided into three portions, which are known as Kalibanga 1, Kalibanga 2 and Kalibanga 3 today by archaeologists. The first one is a citadel. It has large houses, perhaps public buildings. The second one has the houses of the citizens along straight roads with uh, streets running at right angles and Kalibanga 3 is a small enclosure where perhaps the poorer people, the working people lived. These were known to the British archaeologists as the Cooley Lines. This clear demarcation suggests a society that had evolved considerably. The Harappan cities seemed to stand out suddenly as pockets of urban grandeur, while elsewhere in the subcontinent, people were still living in small settlements and experimenting with food production. However, a closer look at some of the sites, like the fortified town of Dholavira, for instance, shows that this was not the case. The cities evolved slowly, in stages, and through the remains which have been found, we can locate some of these stages. Right from the beginning, we have been finding here certain natural Harappan traits. But by and large, the pottery or other items were somewhat different. It means the Harappa culture was in its very early stages of evolution. Because all the mature Harappan elements are not there. Just a few are slowly emerging from within the culture itself. And at that time, it was a small, a small fortress. In stage two, the fortress was further augmented, further broadened. And settlement started extending towards the north as well as the east. And in third stage, which is of course a very creative stage at Dhoravira, we find that this, the earlier settlement was converted into a citadel. The excavations at all the Harappan sites indicate the existence of granaries and other storage facilities. The granaries usually faced the rivers which were used as trading highways. In Lothal, the granary was very close to the dockyard. Trade was not only carried out within the subcontinent, but also with Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, where a similar Bronze Age culture flourished. The mainstay of the culture 
was trade and commerce, large-scale craft activities, mass production of consumer goods for the for consumption in their domestic market as well as outside. They had a very big network of international trade. They were trading regularly with the Gulf countries, Mesopotamia, and possibly in the trans himalayan area also. Apart from trading their produce, the Harappan people needed a constant supply of raw materials, including important metals, for their various activities. One of the intriguing issues about the Chalcolithic people is about their access to metals. And these metals, in the case of the Indus Valley Civilization, are copper, zinc and tin. Now while zinc and tin could have come from mines in Central Asia, the nearest known source of copper for the Indus Valley are the Khetri mines in eastern Rajasthan. Who mined that copper from there and how did it reach the people of the Indus Valley? Recent research hypothesizes that it was not the Indus Valley people who were taking copper out of the Khetri mines, but another people, people who are known as part of the Ganeshwar culture. They mined the copper and traded it across the sand dunes which provided the natural eastern frontier of the... We all know of course that the Indus Valley civilization were very good at trade and who got the better of that bargain should be obvious. The people of the Indus Valley were urban, sophisticated and rich. The people of the Ganeshwar culture were pre-urban and perhaps poor. Lothal on the Gujarat coast is a classic Harappan site and gives us plenty of evidence about these finely honed trading skills. One can imagine that it was a very busy harbour city in its heyday. Town planning is a hallmark of all the Indus Valley sites. The streets ran at right angles to each other. Every house had a back door opening into a bylane and an elaborate plumbing system. I got a system, sir. साफ करता this remarkable drainage system was a consistent feature in all the Harappan cities. Ironically, just a couple of kilometers from the site at Dhulavira, the successors of these ancient people have retained no memory of the civic life. गांव में हमारे लोग कुछ भी नहीं सीखा जिसको ये जानता है उसको इंटरेस्ट है बाकी लोग इतना पढ़े लिखे नहीं है तो उसके इंटरेस्ट भी नहीं है कम लोगों को है गांव वाले कहते हैं पूरा ना ये नगर है कि उसमें कुछ गांव है पर जैसे दत्त कथा है पुरानी कि ये तो शमशान है तो पुराने जो दत्त सजदा है ना वो लोग कहते हैं कि शमशान को हम नहीं छीन बांध कर सकते क्योंकि उसमें कुछ भूत पलेत होते हैं तो मेरे को बहुत डर लगता है in spite of the extensive archaeological excavations, the Harappan civilization continues its aura of mystery. The first traces of the Indus Valley cities were discovered at Mohenjo-daro by chance in 1921, when a railway track was being laid. Burnt brick was cannibalized from a mysterious local mound to construct the track. The quality of the bricks and the emergence of trinkets from the mound first aroused curiosity. Thus, one civilization hurrying forward stumbled upon the remnants of another and uncovered a past of undreamt of technical skill and artistic riches. But even today, 70 years after the first discovery, there is a lot that we don't know about the Harappans. Theories, inferences and guesses abound. and the numerous seals of the Harappans add an element to the mystery. 
These seals have been found in abundance all over the Indus Valley. Some of them have turned up as far away as Iraq. These discoveries support notions of the importance of trade. The seals may have been used by guilds of merchants and traders. In this one, the figure in the tree may be a deity. It is believed that the Harappans worshipped nature along with a mother figure. The seals have also preserved for us the script that the Harappans used. This script is at the heart of all debates about the Indus Valley culture. It was written from right to left, like Arabic. It had some pictographic elements. None of the numerous attempts to decipher the script has, however, been generally accepted. The uniform construction of all the cities has been interpreted to indicate the control of a central government and possibly a planned economy. The element of historical continuity in this respect of the Indian civilization is evident through a comparison of modern Chandigarh with the ancient cities of the Harappans. The gridiron pattern is the same in both the towns and the unusual thing is that the gridiron of Chandigarh and the gridiron of dimensions of Harappa, that is the arithmetic of the grid and the arithmetic of the grid here, both of them are the same. Both have the same numerical value, you know, 1200 meters by 800 meters in Chandigarh and 1200 feet by 800 feet in Harappa. So the ratios remain the same. You know, and it's, it's very uncanny, but in Chandigarh we know why, because Kabuzia thought of various things before he designed that grid. He said that that was the most appropriate grid for pedestrian walking and all that, but one doesn't know why that grid was 1200 feet by 800 feet in Mohanjodaro. Some historians believe that the raised citadel-like structures at the Harappan sites suggest that the government was theocratic. In any case, religion did play an important part in the life of the people. We can deduce this from structures like the Great Bath at Mohenjo-daro. This was located at the heart of the citadel. As each house had its own individual bathroom, the Great Bath was probably not just for bodily hygiene. It is likely that it served a purpose similar to the Pushkara in Hindu rituals, where bathing symbolizes spiritual purification. The Great Bath had a number of private rooms around it, and it could well have been used for rituals containing a heady mix of politics, religion, and perhaps even ritualized sex. The dancing girl, cast in bronze, is a fine example of the culture of the Indus people. Hundreds of toys and artifacts have been found. The variety of terracotta beads and trinkets excavated testify to a high level of sophistication. This man's sober appearance has been taken to suggest that he may have been a priest or a nobleman. His possible descendant at Kalibangan, however, is a humble peasant. To think of that the Harappan people were peace-loving people, so I don't agree to that. Had that been the case, why they fortified their settlement so zealously, so strongly? What was the necessity? And second, um, the notion that does round is that as if the Harappa culture has a huge empire. But this is very likely that it, in fact it was a cultural or economic or social economic empire within which there were several states, several kingdoms all the time fighting against each other. In any event, despite all its grandeur, the Harappan culture declined and the legacy of urban civilization was lost. History is a discipline which should make you feel both proud and humble. It should make you feel proud because it reminds you of the glorious achievements of ancestors who lived hundreds, thousands of years ago. For instance, this place at Lothal, 
was built by a very sophisticated set of people more than 4500 years ago. It is also a subject which would make you feel humble. Compare Lothal of those days with Surat of today just across the bay. Lothal is a well planned city with a sophisticated drainage system and a great deal of civic pride and a sense of civic opportunity. Surat on the other hand is a mess with lot of greed, lot of wealth and no civic sense whatsoever. Therefore, while Lothal reminds one of Burri, Surat makes one feel sad and it is history which brings out this sense of irony. Changes in climate or the course of the rivers, foreign invasion or simply internal decay have all been put forward to explain the disappearance of the Indus Valley civilization. The hobby horse of many scholars has been to postulate the theory of uh, invasion uh, of Harappan cities by Aryans. And, uh, even Kosambi, Didi Kosambi, uh, he was very emphatic about this invasion theory. Uh, but uh, subsequent uh, scholars, uh, they don't think that uh, the civilization disappeared because of any such invasion. Instead of emphasizing the idea of complete disappearance, it is better to think in terms of uh, gradual decay of uh, the civilization. The cities gave way to rural cultures and the remarkable town planning went underground for centuries. The written word disappeared and the sounds of a totally different culture held sway in the subcontinent. Migrating tribes poured out of Eastern Europe, some going to Western Europe, some to West Asia, and some penetrating the Indian subcontinent. These nomadic herders, loosely known as the Indo-Aryans, started settling in North India around 1500 BC. Their advance into South Asia was long and tortuous. Cultural mingling with the local people modified their original ways and customs. The term Indo-Aryan thus refers to a broad group of tribes which spoke the same language but differed in cultural and physical characteristics. The primary source for the history of these people is the Rig Veda, the oldest of the four Vedas. For almost a thousand years, these hymns were not written down but were only transmitted orally. It is necessary to keep in view that the Vedic literature as a whole was being produced over a, over a very long period, roughly speaking, from about 1500 BC to about 500 BC. This would mean that this massive literature was on the composition for something like 1000 years or probably even more. This is a literature which seems to have been produced by people living over very wide geographical zone which spanned almost the uh, whole of North India barring perhaps Bengal in the East. I think this is the literature which gives us insights into the life of people living in northwestern India, what can be called in modern times is the Afghanistan area. There is the Punjab, the undivided Punjab. We can think of Haryana, Rajasthan, modern Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. The Rig Veda suggests that the Indo Aryans were predominantly pastoralists. They survived chiefly on the produce of the cow. The economic importance of the cow transposed it into a sacred animal in later times. Cattle were often the subject of conflicts between the Aryan tribes and the people known as the Dastus and Panis. The Rig Veda describes these people as dark skinned with flat noses. The Aryans themselves are described as being fairer with sharp features. Vedic texts give clear indication that the relationship was very unfriendly. It was one of hostility between the Indo Aryan speakers and the Dastus and uh, Dasas and Panis. Uh, 
but uh, there is another interesting angle to this whole problem. Dasyu is equivalent to the word uh, Dahyu, which is mentioned in the old Iranian language. And uh, it has been suggested that uh, Dasyus were perhaps one of the earliest people who came to India. Uh, originally they were uh, Indo-Aryans, but they came to India and they adopted the ways uh, of the pre-Aryans in this country to such an extent that when the Rig Vedic Aryans came to India, they found that the mode of life of the Dastis was so different uh, that hostility was inevitable. When the Aryans penetrated South India, this hostility was extended to the Dravidian people. Even till today, some aspects of Indian politics are said to reflect this antagonism in the North-South divide. Aryan culture, over time, spread all over the country. The process of assimilation was often accompanied by conflict, but it took place nevertheless. At the same time, even as the composite culture of India evolved, the survival of tribal pockets and alternative cults and traditions shows the persistence of some of the older cultures. This survival marks the continuing plurality which makes up India. Thank you.